Um, my name is Meg Only. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, my name is Maori, and I am reading the intro for Meg, uh, who is temporarily blind. So, thank you to Jesse Pyers and James Fratz at Lightbox Home Center for hosting our screening, and to the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage for their generous support of colored people time. In developing this project, one of the goals was to highlight the contradictions of temporality. Colored People Time has developed in a format that is out of sync with the time we live in under late capital. Mundane futures came first, quotidian past, the current exhibition on view featuring the work of Matthew Angelo Harrison came second, and we will conclude with the last iteration, banal presence. In tonight's screening, we wanted to highlight the many, hmm, sorry. These are loose notes. <laughs> We wanted to highlight the many violences of history, colonialism, imperialism, nationalism, and how they have formed and informed the creation of the museum collection. With recent measures for repatriating African objects from museum collections in France, the violence of the museum is under scrutiny, but the futures of these collections is still very much unknown. The films tonight shift from documentary modes to the essay film to CGI animation. They cover sub-Saharan African objects, Senegalese villages, prehistoric remains, and indigenous sovereignty. Despite their wide range of historical periods and cultures, they point to the presentness of history in the objects that surround us. We are grateful for Zach Khalil and Jackson Paulus, who are both with us this evening who along with Adam Khalil directed the second film tonight, The Violence of a Civilization Without Secrets, and will join me, Mayori Carmel Holmes, in conversation after the screening, which will be followed by a Q&A. Thank you and enjoy. Thank you. Um, let's give uh, Zach and Jackson a round of applause. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to you in the audience. Um, so um, one of the things that I was struck by, um, I hadn't seen the Trim and Ha film since like 20 years, <laughs> and one of the things that I was thinking about is that, oh no, sorry, my questions just disappeared. Okay, um, one of the things that I was struck by was um, it was reading her words that helped me um, begin to think, like have the language for decolonizing and um, even sort of um, thinking about language and writing very differently. And I was wondering for both of you, who gave you that permission? Good question. <laughs> In terms of the permission to openly speak about decolonization. To think about like, it, to, think to about conceive it. of it. Um, we're, not, we're not taught that, you know? We're, right. So even if you don't believe, I mean, I don't know about your backgrounds, but I mean, even if your parents don't teach you that colonization is correct at school, you are taught that it is, it is fact, right? And so it, it, for me, I guess, personally, I didn't think about it until I was reading some of, um, I remember Trendenhoff first, to actually think about the project of decolonizing and literally like inform mm -hmm. what that means. So that's what I'm asking. Sorry yeah. for the clunkiness. No, that's a great question. I just, I, for me personally, I had to go way back. Um, and uh, for me, it's, it's my mother, um, who was an indigenous scholar uh, who studied information science from an indigenous perspective, specifically thinking about the archive um, and sort of who owns history and who's able to tell whose history. Um, and she was working closely um, with a few institutions to sort of reconfigure their thinking around collections um, and was working on her dissertation um, when she passed away and I sort of started my uh, film or artistic career trying to kind of pick up where she left off. Mm. Um, so I think in some ways, I mean, as, as a kid in middle school, high school, you know, uh, decolonization was a word that was thrown around all the time, I guess, uh, almost to the extent where maybe I didn't, I don't think I really thought about it. Uh, thought about what it, it really meant, um, I think until later, until uh, getting a little bit of distance from it, to be honest. Um, and then I think just one of the other more recent references that has sort of reconfigured how I think about that term 
um, essay, uh, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, uh, by Tuck and Yang. Um, and that, there's just so much discourse around the, the, the idea of decolonization. I feel like it can be really, uh, potentially can be an ineffective term if, if not taken seriously, you know? And like decolonization isn't necessarily just a way to uh, improve colonial institutions, right? Like that's always an interesting question. Like how can you decolonize a colonial institution? Is that a worthy project in the first place? Do you destroy it? Do you make it something else entirely? Um, and I, yeah, I think that's where that, that's where I want to, my brain takes that conversation, I think more recently, and that's sort of the origins of yeah, my interactions with it, learning to be able to think that way in the first place, uh, and not just in a metaphorical sense, but in a, in a real sense. Yeah, I, w I would also have to take a biographical kind of approach to that question. Um, I grew up in what is currently called Alaska, um, Southeast Alaska. My father was an artist, he was a carver, um, a Tlingit carver. He was kind of involved in the rena with the so-called renaissance of um, where native artists were trying to reclaim what had been lost due to a lot of these objects having been taken in the first place. So I grew up in a, my foray into art was in that context. My, my um, participation in art in general was, was starting with carving behind ropes for tourists coming in off the cruise ships um, and capturing our souls. So my, you know, in that process. So my sensitivity to that started from an early age and I always felt kind of alienated from my ability to fully delve into the um, reproduction of my culture in the way that my father had. But he was a, a native artist. He was, my mother was white and Tlingit is a matrilineal culture. So there was also that other kind of alienation where I was not able to claim this kind of lineage that he was, even though I was working as a native artist. So that was one way in which my sensitivity kind of um, was exacerbated and that kind of keyed me into um, the ways in which nativeness was domesticated continuously, especially in Alaska, where you have a, a higher percentage of native people there, but there's this desire to contain it and make it a native Alaskan and make it within the state. And I always felt that there were little, like these different percolating resistances to that that weren't all, that were continually repressed um, by the need to continue this kind of um, outward performance of indigeneity from Native people. So those were some of the things that, um, and the removal was something I was continuously having to negotiate, like this feeling of decay that was just, you know, kind of mentioned analogously in the marker, um, where people are doing these things and trying to keep some aspect of their culture alive by carving in a way, but there's a lot of loss there and you don't want to admit the loss, but that's something that has to be negotiated. Um, and so it becomes an obligation to have to speak about decolonization just to bring these things up, even before you, want, before you enter into it in an academic way in which it's used now. So that was kind of my experience. And then speaking of um, Tuck, who's also from Alaska, um, but teaches in Canada now, decolonization is not a metaphor. Well, it, that assertion is that true coloniz decolonization would require the repatriation of all indigenous land. So if we're going to try to take that seriously, it becomes almost a ludicrous proposition so that it immediately, even if you make the assertion that it's not a metaphor, that in itself starts to become, to kind of loop around this metaphorical context. So trying to deal with that is, <laughs> is one of the things we're, we're continuing to grapple with today. Thank you. Um, I wanna ask a, a obvious question. Um, how did you conceive of the film, um, starting with its title, um, and what were your goals in its final uh, form? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, the, 
titled specifically uh, The Violence of a Civilization Without Secrets is from a Baudrillard essay, uh, Ramsey's in the Rosy-Colored Resurrection, uh, which is specifically kind of thinking about uh, this sort of scientific desire to, to preserve culture, to preserve artifacts, and using the examples of Egyptian mummies, which is, is interesting, where um, at the time that it was being written, there was a lot of problems with conserving mummies, um, like in British museums, uh, because they were uh, decomposing, right? Um, and sort of the idea behind that essay was thinking about how the Egyptians, and full disclosure, I'm Egyptian as well, um, you know, created this sort of like mastery over death um, with the, the pyramids and the mummification itself. And it was only like in the act of trying to preserve these mummies that destroyed them effectively, you know? Um, and then in terms of the film itself, The Violence of a Civilization Without Secrets, um, originally commissioned um, by um, The Inhabitants, which is an art collective, uh, they were doing something for the Contour Biennial, uh, which was specifically thinking about this idea of justice. Uh, it took place in Belgium, I think in some uh, city where some of the earliest courts uh, were. Um, and the inhabitants specifically, it's a, a platform for video projects, which kind of tap into like the form of like social media video in the sense of they want them to be experimental videos that are informative or perhaps journalistic to a certain extent. Um, so th that was the prompt for us, basically. Uh, and then in terms of why we decided to do the Kennewick Man in particular, uh, we've always been interested in repatriation, specifically repatriation of human remains. Um, my tribe, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, does a lot of repatriation work, and one of my childhood friends is currently the repatriation specialist for our tribe, so it's her job to petition institutions um, like Penn to get human remains back. Um, and so I've always been sort of in that world. Uh, and then, to be honest, the, I'd heard about the Kennewick Man, but the thing that really caught my interest more than anything else was the 60 Minutes piece, um, just because its tone was so absurd uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, and really tone deaf, right? Uh, and, you know, it's funny, too, because 60 Minutes, they never, they never followed up that story either. Um, so a big impetus for the film in some ways was just like, uh, you know, we'd started it in 20, yeah, 2017. So the Kennewick Man, the ancient one, had just been repatriated officially. So part of it was really wanting to update that story. And then because of the commission, it sort of influenced the style. Like typically, uh, I wouldn't, creatively speaking, like there's a lot of text, there's a lot of exposition, uh, which isn't necessarily something that we, we generally do, but it was sort of part of the format and I think uh, enabled it to, to be what it became. And also then taking that conversation further beyond the Kennewick Man to think more about museums and collecting practices in general. Yeah, and I think also with that 60 minute story and that we deem it as something that's, you know, humorous. And there's also this as the Asa True Folk Assembly, the white supremacist group that is really trying to claim who we're here who is here first. And you see that coming up in the 60 minutes where it's like the real question of concern is like, who is here first? And so it's interesting for us to think about that and this kind of overlap when it comes to how people want to push that kind of desire off on someone else, something extreme, something kind of tone deaf, but the way that that desire to feel at home here, to become native, um, requires this kind of pushing off of pushing off onto these other elements that might be more ignorant or nefarious. Um, but that desire does still persist. Um, so that's, uh, that was kind of a way of like hooking around to kind of focus on this kind of nebulous nature of that desire and what might, what we might be able to do with that. Thanks. Um, I'm always struck by um, how the more advanced we become technologically, we realize that all the stories are actually true. <laughs> you know, that's fun. Um, how did you all come to work together and also with your brother? Um, is that, this is not your first project together. And so how did, how did you come to be a unit? Yeah, um, me and my brother first worked together to create our 
uh, debut feature film, and not to say, um, which tells the story of our community back in Michigan through the Seven Fires Prophecy, which kind of blends past, present, and future in, in a way that speaks to me, and I think the exhibition as well. Um, and I think it was a screening or of that that led us to meet? I think you met Adam first, Yeah, right? I met Adam at an E-Flex event uh, in New York, um, and he was working with um, at a screening of Audre, with Audra Simpson, who was also there. So I had been in Columbia um, and been friends with Audra for a while. Um, so I met Adam then, and we were talking and trying to figure out how to meet up, work, like, share our work together. Um, but schedule-wise, um, I didn't end up meeting Zach until after the, they finished, and not to say, at the MoMA screening. And then we met up and we're, yeah. This was our, the, we had other, we have other projects which we started then and we're still continuing to do, but this was, uh, that prompt arose and allowed us to um, finish that piece first. Yeah. yeah, this is our first work together. Um, and we've recently been collaborating uh, as a public secret society called the New Red Order. Did you say a public secret society? Yeah. Um, uh, you, you guys are welcome to join, too. Uh, but it, it focuses specifically, which this piece gets to, is sort of about uh, this desire for indigeneity, this desire uh, to be indigenous or to appropriate the indigenous, um, and thinking about ways that we as indigenous artists who are often asked into museums and universities to sort of act as informants in the sort of traditional anthropological context um, in ways that we can make that relationship more reciprocal and benefit indigenous people in ways that we can make that, that desire for indigeneity um, be something that actually benefits indigenous people and it points towards um, us having futures as opposed to sort of this ideal past always. Thanks. Um, What is your current, um, I think, um, to try to relate it a little bit um, to uh, the show is, what's your relationship to museums? I mean, if you're exhibiting work in these contemporary spaces and maybe not so contemporary, but um, how, do, how do you feel about that? I think every, obviously every institution has its own framework, its dis unique disciplinarity. Um, some institutions are collecting institutions, others are exhibiting, and so you have, um, I think with collecting institutions, there's this weight of the collection that, uh, that contributes to a kind of inertia that perhaps not all the curators would want, but it also, that kind of feeling ends up becoming naturalized often in people who work at various institutions, like they become accustomed to their own um, depending on how long they stay, right? That they start becoming comfortable in working in, in these various modes. So I think it becomes a challenge. I've worked like with the American Museum of Natural History where this was shot. Um, I mean, one of the ways I worked in that institution or we worked in the institution was to go in there in a kind of rogue fashion and get this footage and a kind of um, salvage ethnographic, like we were doing our, so it was the, the, North, the Hall of the Northwest Coast Indians that kind of institution, every, every hall of North American or non-European peoples is framed contiguous, is contiguous to a representation of early humans. So that is really reinforced in the floor plan. Um, and so even when they go and try to update the halls, which I was also called into that institution as a consultant to try to figure out how to update within that, and I've also been involved in going in that institution, not as a consultant for that particular hall, but also as an informant who would help the museum consider how, if they want to decolonize, what might that require, things like that. Um, so I've, I've, had to, as an, I've had to be an informant um, and accept my complicity in these various roles. Um, but I think those kinds of desires to co-opt, I'm, it doesn't necessarily require a collecting institution. Like other more contemporary institutions might want something like an indigenous voice or they might, they might be hunting for that indigenous person to 
find authorization so that they can do something like territorial acknowledgement, which has become in vogue, like in Canada and, and from um, other, other, like Australia, crown countries. Um, so they want someone to come in and tell them the proper way to do this territorial acknowledgement, and that becomes a kind of space where there's a potential for this extractive movement of wanting this, this knowledge, this, this information, so that they can do the right thing and then feel justified. They can perform the call in the same way that Native people might. They can become Native by doing so. They can have that relationality. Um, so there, is, there are these various ways in which that can happen regardless of whether it's a collecting institution or not. Yeah, I mean, kind of like Jason said, often it's, it's working with institutions, um, but also doing our own things when necessary, and when working with them, trying to make the relationship as reciprocal as possible. Um, like, yeah, what, what can the institution contribute uh, in turn? Um, and sometimes that's access to collections, sometimes that's territorial acknowledgement, sometimes that's the institution opening up the space to indigenous people in other ways. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just trying to make that more of a reciprocal relationship as much as possible. Um, this will be my last question and I'm gonna try to uh, ask it smoothly. Um, so I think we've talked a little bit about um, in the uh, in the intro, but also I think this show is thinking about museums as sites of violence and um, extraction and these things. But we also know that photography and filmmaking as a result of that is also extractive and um, violent and even the language, everything around um, film and photography is related to you know, war. So how did you all come to filmmaking? And how do you see yourselves, um, if you do at all, as uh, helping to redirect this kind of practice of violence? How are you countering that in your practice? Yeah, I think uh, for me again, <laughs> uh, this, this goes back to my mom uh, and her thinking about uh, indigenous information and information from indigenous perspective. She started to get into video and film it, itself as well um, and wrote a, a poem I love called Native Videographer Shoot Back, to use that violent metaphor as well. Um, and I think, yeah, first of all, coming, coming to film that way through her uh, made me think a lot, of course, about the history of film before I my first film, not to say, it was tells the seven fires prophecy. When I knew that I wanted to make it, I knew that I needed to seriously interrogate the history of film and its relationship with indigenous people, because it's so fraught. Um, one of the earliest films is Thomas Edison's uh, Sioux Ghost Dance, which is like uh, Indians dancing for the Buffalo Bills Wild West show for a white audience. The Nook of the North is often cited as like one of the first documentaries, and it's like a piece of branded content for a French fur company that's really patronizing and misleading. So there's this like history where indigenous people are often in the center of the frame from the beginning of the form itself uh, and often to their detriment. So an awareness of that, first of all, <laughs> uh, was the first thing required. And then from that starting point, realizing that all of the conventions of film then, whether documentary or narrative oftentimes, are really rooted in this like settler colonial epistemology in the first place, and then trying to break it open from there to try to not be rooted to those conventions, to try to think critically about not just what indigenous, but in terms of our own specific tribes, or Anishinaabe ways of thinking about time, of storytelling, um, of identification, of relation, and to try to make the film form reflect that different epistemology. So it's like, because the medium itself generally has this like really extractive approach, um, trying to think about why that is the case and, and where that's rooted, which is often just in the forms that are already established, um, and to try to think about ways of changing that. And sometimes that can just be um, being more open to the process, being more open to people, spending a lot more time. It's a lot of different ways that can sort of be realized, and it's a, a, a lifelong task to try to figure that out as well. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think we're definitely both thinking about the, the possibility for the inversion of the power dynamic um, and what are various ways of, of doing that. I think in this film, um, one of the ways we went about doing that was to allow for a certain amount of performativity, anonymity, where we have this group of kind of unclear, it's a little bit unclear who they are, um, performing the performing arm of the New Red Order, these initiates who are going and masking themselves to try to understand what it is about, to try to figure out what their difference is and acknowledging their complicity and performing as proxy for us. So that extension and for kind of formalization of that removal is a way of um, allowing ourselves not to be the ones under the, in the, in the frame. Um, so that's one way of doing so. Um, but that's at the expense, or that, that is with the danger of, um, by using these people as accomplices or as willing proxy for us, we are also marking that space where they are risking the removing us by, we're, we're putting them in a position where they have to reckon with the fear that they might be doing something inappropriate by standing in for us when obviously, even with the, these films, um, like The Marker and The Trimenta, which are doing something that's counter to, that's countering, there's also this kind of way in which a reflexivity can become, can overtake the representation. So, um, with the acknowledgement that we need a certain degree of reflexivity to even to, can, to move forward and so that people can see where they're blocking the representation of, the self-representation of other, of the people themselves, so. I don't know, that's one of the ways we're trying to do so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any questions <laughs> in the audience? Um, one of the things that um, I thought that was really interesting that you mentioned was the uh, part of decolonization is dealing with uh, colonial epistemologies. So the nature of the ethnographic museum was initially like didactic, right? So like I think one of the sort of contradictions of being uh, of let's say policies like NAGPRA is that um, because the museum has this kind of history of fixing or cementing or uh, making things still uh, dead in a way, you know these these collecting objects. Um, one way that what NAGPRA does is that it decenters that kind of entire framework of thinking. And it's, it's not that the objects are passive and inert, but they have um, a sort of life. Um, they have a sort of like living history. So um, I wonder in, in the context of repatriation, uh, particularly with um, objects that have sacred value or objects that have a religious purpose, how, how can we think about decolonization by, you know, getting rid of the idea that museums are fixing things, that these objects have, are, are sort of like stand-ins, stand like they have like some sort of um, capacity to, to be living in a way. Um, and I think one example of that that's happened recently in Philadelphia is um, an Assamese group, um, you know, from the northeast of India, they, saw, um, they realized that a part of a cloth was in the Philadelphia um, South Asian collection. And they, that's actually, you know, they've come here from Assam to, um, you know, worship, it, it, use it in a sort of ritual use. Um, so that's one example of in which, like, in a case in which museums are using, they're trying to decenter the idea that these objects are not even just going to going back to another museum, but actually um, being used in the way in which they were attended. So how, how is the process of re, uh, repatriation necessarily bound up with this kind of like colonial uh, epistemology? Yeah, that, that's, that's super interesting. I think in some ways too, uh, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about ways that museums can um, 
not carry that connotation of fixing objects and, and therefore killing them. Um, I mean, for me, it seems like that's pretty deeply entrenched, and it's all about like power and control then too. And like, the museum agreed to let these people come in for this period of time, right? But didn't give it back to them, I figure. Which again seems like oh, well, maybe a step in the right direction, but a bit of bit of a half step, right? Um, and repatriation is really loaded and complicated in and of itself. I mean, like, um, you know, when I say repatriation, I'm thinking of objects, sacred objects, funerary objects, and human remains themselves. And, you know, first of all, the word itself is like super patriarchal, right? I mean, from my tribe's context, when we repatriate human beings, you know, we're, we're rematriating them, if you really want to go that way. Um, and also just the fact that in order to actually repatriate an object or an ancestor, you have to go through the legal system, which involves treating them as an object, as, as not an animate thing, fundamentally. So like for tribes or anybody to even initiate that process, they sort of have to make that concession to that colonial epistemology, right, right off the bat. It's a sort of like necessary evil. Um, and yeah, uh, one of the things uh, I always think about is this difference between like information and, and knowledge, um, where it's like information is something, uh, especially in library sciences, you know, information should be all, for, for all, right? Information should be freely available. Um, but that knowledge is, is for some, and that knowledge is, is something more restrictive and is not something that is universally accessible, but that is gained through experience and, and interaction. And so I think so many of those objects that are incarcerated in collections, to sort of use that analogy, because it's, it's quite apt, I think, especially when you're talking about human remains, um, I think that when things are separated from their context, from the people that use them, from the people that uh, ascribe meaning and value to them, it, it, yeah, it, it does kill them, uh, at least for that moment. And the only way to change that is, is to not, not put them, not divorce them from their context, in my mind. But, uh, you know, I have an open mind, too. I don't want to be dogmatic, but that's where I go with it. Yeah, I think those kind of activities allow for the museum to um, reconcile itself with the problematic nature of its own ownership um, and the removal of those objects. Um, so that's why I think that this, like this essay, the Tuck essay, decolonization is not a metaphor if true repatriation demands the return of all indigenous objects, land, and life, then what does that really require? Like it really requires something fundamentally up unsettling, and but also and also risks contributing to the denial of contemporaneity, where we think that these natives or these people who are wanting this thing returned are doing something that's passe. Why can't we just get over it? Why can't we just realize that we're living in a society in which um, we're okay with deterritoriality? Um, the kind of territorial nature is like bound up with this kind of tribalism and this is something that's a problem today still. Um, there are these weird kind of overlaps that contribute to our inability to give that up. Um, and we're also dealing with that the removal of Indian people, um, indigenous people, the, the removal of them from this land required a kind of violence which um, which was enabled by a distinction in terms of property. So you have the belief that native people don't have a kind of, don't have property in the same way that Western capitalist people have property. So there's that kind of thing that contributes to de a denial of contemporaneity, but also an inability to accept that these are things that are owned, that if you want to emphasize context and overemphasize context, there's a reason for that, that they might not slip into this thing, this religion or art or spirituality. It might be something totally different that we don't yet know. And then maybe it's okay not to know that and to give them back.
So um, thank you for being here. Um, I was thinking about film and the um, kind of capaciousness of film, um, despite this violent history that um, you all alluded to earlier. Um, and specifically what got me thinking about it is that one of the earliest examples of a territorial acknowledgement that we have in film by a non-native filmmaker um, is by Tony Cade Bambara um, in the bombing of Osage Avenue. And that film was made in um, 1989. And so, um, and it's about the domestic bombing um, of the um, move house in Philadelphia. And so I was wondering um, if film is more um, capacious than other forms in kind of building that solidarity or that identity um, of solidarity um, and kind of your experience as different kinds of makers. Um, and so what is it about film? What are its limits? Um, just to respond to that. <laughs> I would say yes, um, if only because it seems to me at the moment like obvious that, that if we're trying to compare in different kinds of art making, I mean maybe that's a premature kind of um, selection in itself, um, but you know obviously objects are bound up with their alienability. Um, that with film, you have you have the performance, you have objects within them, you have movement, you have all the, all these things. It's like an accumulation of many different media in itself, and it. Um, I mean, it, I think it does have its limits, and but I think in terms of the violence of it, in terms of the capture, and it's difficult to get around that kind of the the stuckness of trying to reflect on certain things and criticize them at the same time. And, but I think because of the sequential nature of that mixed with the montage capabilities, I think, yeah, for me at the moment, in terms of, I may change my mind in a moment, but um, I do think because of that sequential moment by moment nature and that of thought that that offers, I do think it has, the most that I can think of. Yeah, I think uh, film really appeals to me because it's so dynamic and ephemeral and because the medium is time more than anything else um, in ways that allow you to sort of uh, explode or deconstruct notions of history or past, present, or future that I think is, is harder to do in something that's fixed. Um, also, um, just from a more, on a more personal level, I just realized the extent to which the moving image has really influenced the way I perceive and move through the world in terms of it, it sort of having a very effective, like sort of agitprop propaganda effect, um, whether it's uh, commercialism or applied to radical politics or anything else, I think it, it can film can really move people in a really intense way. Um, I think the other thing that is really striking about it and that uh, it's hard to see anywhere else is it's sort of like physiological impact in and of itself. Um, I think it can make people feel things physically and intuitively that they might not be able to articulate or understand otherwise and that that might be a, a space that can create greater solidarity as well, sort of uh, getting outside of, of language as well a little bit. Um, unfortunately, we're gonna have to conclude oh. here. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion and for being here. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so much.